Hello and welcome to my channel English Literature Made Easy with Saswati. On popular demand, today I'll be talking about feminism. This video is going to be a detailed and comprehensive video wherein I will try and cover almost everything about feminism. I'll begin the video with a definition of feminism, then I will talk about its historical development leading to the various waves of feminism, so you will get an in-depth idea of how feminism took shape and arrived at the present moment. So do watch the video from the beginning till the end without skipping it if you want to know about the movement. So now let's begin. First of all, we need to know that feminism is a layered and loaded term just like an onion. The moment you peel one layer, you, you are confronted with another layer and so on. Because women around the world have diversified realities and experiences. But of course, the basic idea is the same even if it has its multi-layered significance. So in general, feminism is advocacy of the rights of women based on the idea of uh, equality of the sexes. Now you have to know what is equality of the sexes. Equality of the sexes or sexual equality or gender equality means when people of all genders, be it men or women, have equal social, economic and political rights, responsibilities and opportunities. Now the question is why this idea of feminism came into being in the first place. It came into being because society, I am talking about Western society here since we are talking about Western feminism was largely patriarchal or male dominated and women were routinely discriminated in every sphere of the society. Having said that, not every man is a patriarch and not every woman is a feminist. Senseless male bashing for each and everything doesn't make a woman a feminist. In fact, the term feminism was coined in 1837 by a man. He was French philosopher and utopian socialist named Charles Fourier. Fourier considered women as individuals and not as half-humans. He believed that the traditional institution of marriage was oppressive towards women and that is the reason he never married himself. He believed that all important jobs should be open to women on the basis of skill and aptitude rather than closed on account of gender. Now let's move on to the history of feminism. Even before the existence of the feminist movement, a lot of writers, philosophers and activists have spoken in favor of women's equality. Ancient Greek philosopher Plato argued for sexual and political equality of women. On the other hand, there was an enlightenment philosopher G. Jack Rousseau who believed in human equality but then he saw women as silly and frivolous creatures born to be subordinate to men. So as you can see, women were excluded from the fruits of the enlightenment thought. But around that same time came Mary Wollstonecraft's revolutionary a vindication of the rights of women which was published in 1792 and it is considered now to be one of the earliest works of feminist philosophy but back then the word feminist or feminism didn't even appear. Nonetheless attacking Rousseau Wollstonecraft reasons that women are capable of rationality. It is just that men have refused to educate them and encourage them to be frivolous or insubstantial. As against this popular belief in the 18th century that women do not deserve to receive rational education, Wollstonecraft argues that society will denigrate without educated women, primarily because mothers are the primary educators to young children. She speaks in favor of co-educational schooling because she believes that men and women who make up the society should be educated after the same model. Wollstonecraft's work had significant impact on women's rights advocates in the 19th century. Early 19th century English utilitarian philosopher Jeremy Bentham again spoke for a complete equality between the sexes and he voiced in favor of women's suffrage, women's right to divorce and hold political office. So by the 19th and 20th centuries, a number of feminist actions were prompted in the West that are referred to as waves of feminism and we are going to look at it one by one. But first, we will move on with the first wave of feminism, which roughly spans from 1848 to 1920. So first wave of feminism was the real political movement for the Western world that started in the USA. 
you have to be familiar with the names of the first wave feminists. And the first name is Elizabeth Cady Stanton, second one Lucretia Mott, third one Suzanne B. Anthony. First wave of feminism began with the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, when about 200 women met at a church in upstate New York to discuss about their grievances. Now, it's very important to know what did they demand. Well, first they claimed that all men and women were created equal and then passed a list of 12 resolutions seeking equal legal and political rights like men. Specifically, the most radical demand, the right to vote. So first wave feminists are also called suffragists. This is considered a landmark event in the history of feminism because this is the first ever women's rights convention such as the world had ever seen. Victorian America saw women acting in very unladylike ways for the first time as they were engaged in public speaking, demonstrating and had stints in jail which challenged the cult of domesticity. Now let's look at the achievements from the first wave of feminism. The first big achievement was undoubtedly the right to vote. Second one, the granting of married women's property rights. Third one, divorce laws. And fourth one, women got equal custody rights to their children. Now let's look at the limitations of first wave of feminism. The Seneca Falls Convention, which was the first ever women's rights convention, was created when Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott were denied sitting at the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. Many abolitionists who were also feminists and it was the anti-slavery movement that fueled the first wave of feminism. But despite such close relation between the abolitionist movement and the first wave of feminism, the first wave lacked inclusivity. What I mean by it is that the first wave excluded issues of discrimination faced by women of color based on race and gender and focused typically on middle class white western women. Please note here because this is very very important. While black men were granted the right to vote along with white women, black women were denied the political right to vote. That is why activists like the African-American Sojourner Truth demanded, ain't I a woman? These questions and issues that were excluded in the first wave of feminism were included in the subsequent waves of feminism, as we will see. And this is the reason why I was telling in the beginning of the video that feminism is like an onion. Once you peel it, you will be confronted with many layers underneath. And with that idea in mind, we now move on to the second wave of feminism. So second wave of feminism time frame is 1963 to the 1980s. Now you must be wondering as to what happened during the vast gap of 40 years between the end of the first wave roughly in the 1920s and the beginning of the second wave of feminism in the 1960s. No, women's issues were neither solved nor did they disappear. A lot of things happened in between such as uh, the Second World War. During World War II, which lasted from 1939 to 1945, men in the US were out in the battlefield. So, uh, women were placed in positions of power in factories and industries. Now, don't think that women had access to these professionally powerful positions because they were thought to be capable enough. On the contrary, it was posed as women's national duty to fill up the spaces left blank by the men of the country and serve as their proxy and keep the country running in their absence. Popular media characters such as Rosie the Riveter were created as part of the USS national campaign to encourage women to come out and work in the war industries and fill up the labor gap. But when the war was over, the war heroes, that means the men, returned from the battlefield and women were forced to return back to their positions of domesticity. In fact, the government in the US circulated a propaganda that urged women to go back and take care of their home and children. Naturally, it created a sense of dissatisfaction and unfulfillment among the educated women as they lost their economic independence. The second wave of feminism invokes the idea that the personal is political. This phrase was popularized by feminist Carol Hennessy's essay, 
the personal is political what is meant by this phrase is that women's as personal or private issues such as sex child care or the idea that women were not content in their roles as housewives and mothers were not private issues anymore but were issues that needed political intervention to bring in change in 1963 Betty Friedan published a non-fiction book called The Feminine Mystic in which she challenged the post-World War II belief that it was women's destiny to marry and bear children. Friedan's book became a bestseller and it began to raise women's consciousness who agreed that homemaking in the suburbs deprived them of their individualism and left them unsatisfied. So one solution to the problem is to give women jobs on the basis of their capability. Now let's see who are the second wave feminists. Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, Simone de Beauvoir, Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, Kate Millett and Alice Walker. Now let's look at the achievements of second wave feminism. The first achievement was the Equal Pay Act of 1963 which addresses sex discrimination in the work front and makes it illegal for private employers to have different pay rates for men and women doing the same work. The second achievement was, in many cases, women needed a male co-signer before they could get loans or credit cards. But the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974 gave women the right to access credit under their own names and to apply for mortgages without any discrimination of sex age or marital status. Third achievement was abortion was legalized and women were given the right to use birth control. The approval of the contraceptive pill gave women more control over their reproductive rights. Fourth achievement was marital rape was outlawed. Shelters were made by the government for women fleeing rape and domestic violence. Fifth achievement was Awareness around domestic violence was raised and a lot of gender and women's studies departments were founded at universities and colleges during the 1960s and 70s. Sixth achievement was that legislations were made against sexual harassment of women in the work front. Now let's summarize the first and the second wave of feminism. While the first wave of feminism focused on political equality, especially the right to vote, during the second wave of feminism, women were concerned about their reproductive rights and were concerned about their own body. Second wave of feminism wanted to enhance the personal and the professional lives of women. Now let's look at the third wave of feminism, which spans roughly from the 1990s to the 2010s. Third wave feminists are Judith Butler, Rebecca Walker, Anita Hill. Now let's look at the key points of third wave of feminism. Please remember that third wave of feminism was sparked by two particular movements, one political and the other cultural or subcultural. Now let's begin with the political movement first. So attorney Anita Hill testified against the US Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas for sexual harassment in the televised testimony to an all male, all white, Senate Judiciary Committee, Hill declared that African-American judge Thomas had repeatedly harassed her while she was his employee. Despite Hill's testimony, Thomas was still confirmed as a Supreme Court Justice and Hill was maligned for daring to speak publicly of her own experience of sexual abuse. But after Anita Hill's case, many other women had the courage to speak out against their own experiences with sexual misconduct. Responding to this, Anita Walker's daughter, Rebecca Walker, wrote an article in Miss Magazine titled Becoming the Third Wave, where she insists, I am the third wave, which means that third wave is not just a mere reaction to a high voltage political incident, but a movement in itself. And quite rightly so, because after Anita Hill's case, feminists began to push for a more active role in political leadership because they believe that Clarence Thomas was still confirmed as a justice because of the over-representation of men in national leadership roles. So the very next year, a record number of women senators were elected in the United States, which was never witnessed in any previous decade. 
Following this, year 1992 became known as the year of the woman. In 1989, gender and race theory scholar Kimberley Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality to talk about how different forms of oppression based on gender, class and race overlap. This theory led to intersectional feminism that developed as a response to the multiple ways women are oppressed. Remember that women's oppression does not depend on the single factor of gender but it depends on various other layers such as race class, ethnicity, and so on. If you can pause here and recollect what I said while talking about the limitations of the first wave of feminism, you will understand that all those shortcomings of the first wave of feminism and the second wave of feminism were addressed in the third wave. While first and second wave of feminism centered primarily around white, middle class, western women's issues, Third wave of feminism challenges or rather avoids these essentialist ideas of a universal female identity. Third wave feminism expands its horizon and addresses issues of oppression based on race, gender, color, class, ethnicity or nationality. A poor black woman would face oppression on the basis of her gender as well as race, class and so on. So the experiences of oppression faced by black women are different from white women and third wave feminism addresses all these issues encountered by women worldwide. So third wave of feminism focuses on diversity and plurality of women's identity which was ignored by the singular and universal Eurocentric feminist identity focused by the two previous waves of feminism. Third wave feminism paved the way for black feminism post-colonial feminism, Dalit feminism and such other categories of feminism depending on women's specific grievances around the world. So we are done with the political moment that fueled the third wave of feminism. Now moving on to the cultural or the subcultural moment that prompted the onslaught of the third wave of feminism. So alongside this political climate that we talked about third wave of feminism owes a great deal as I already told to the subcultural scene of the time. During this time an underground feminist punk movement called Riot Girl. Please pay attention to the name of the band which is very unique. It's Riot Girl immersed in the United States with distinctly feminist agendas. These women started their own bands and created their own publications dedicated to women's empowerment. The punk scene serves as an inspiration for women in which they could express anger and frustration. Please note that these emotions were socially acceptable for male songwriters but were not common for women. Much of their songs addressed issues including sexism, patriarchy, abuse, racism, sexuality and rape. Riot girls are known to support art and music created by gay, lesbian, transgender and such other communities. Popular bands such as Bikini Kill, Brat Mobile and Heavens to Betsy were associated with this trend of activism. By 1991, the Riot Girl manifesto came out and it clearly stated the reasons why there is this recent surge of feminist activism through music. And it said, because we are angry at a society that tells us Girl is equal to dumb, girl is equal to bad, girl is equal to weak. Then there is this group of women artists from New York City known as Gorilla Girls from, formed in 1985. They created posters, billboards and made public appearances in gorilla masks to reveal sexist and racist practices in the art world. At that time, 5% of artists in museums were women, but 85% of the art was, was of naked women. One of their most famous posters was an image of a naked woman in a gorilla mask next to the phrase, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Gender studies writer Judith Butler in her 1990 book, Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity talks about how one's gender identity and sexuality have been shaped, constructed and manipulated by society. 
Developing the theory of gender performance, Butler says that our gendered identity is not biologically given, rather it is an act of performance that grows out of societal norms and creates the illusion of binary sex. So each sex is expected to perform gender stereotypical roles repeatedly given by the society. If anyone does not follow the societal division of gender into male or female, he or she is considered as a non-normative or queer sexual identity. So Butler's book is foundational to queer theory. Butler challenges the feminist movement to introspect the beliefs about sexual identity and questions the idea of the category of woman because the idea of gender is not fixed and that is the reason Butler sees trouble in gender as the title of her book suggests. She is arguing against socially constructed binaries as these binaries are constructed by a masculinist society at large. Inspired by Butler and her ideas in gender trouble, third wave feminism challenges these binary views of gender as masculine and feminine and believes that gendered identity can be fluid and not fixed. It can be heterosexual, queer and so on. So as you can see, we have got a pretty comprehensive idea about feminism and its multifaceted growth over the centuries. I hope this video was helpful for you and if it was helpful for you and if you liked it, then do like it, share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And in my next video, I will be talking about the very recent fourth wave of feminism. So do stay tuned and don't forget to follow me on Instagram and my Facebook page named English Literature Made Easy with Saswati. So I will see you soon in another video uh, with this topic of fourth wave of feminism very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.